Hello, I'm John Brown, Safety Director with Bradbury Stam Construction. Part of our safety program at Bradbury Stam is the passport system. That's these little booklets that every employee and every subcontract employee must carry to work on our job sites, whether you're in Minnesota, Colorado, or New Mexico. This is a very comprehensive program and has been very effective at protecting employees. As we get into the forklift training, we'll go through more about operator training, and that's the purpose of this training video. But before I get into that, I wanted to tell you that in the back of the white covered book will be the certification page that authorizes you to operate a forklift on a Bradbury Stamp site. We do not accept training by any other entity. You can have a forklift card, but you're required to have the passport signed and go through this training video to operate a forklift on a Bradbury Stamp construction site. With that done, let's get into our slideshow. Extended reach forklifts are what we're going to talk about today. These are wonderful machines and they've replaced cranes for large general job sites. A lot of you run these machines, you're very familiar with them, but are you really expert with them? And if I asked for a show of hands, you would always say, yes I am. You know a lot about forklifts, don't you? I do. Sure you do, sure you do. So let me ask you, how strong is this particular forklift? Does anyone know? How strong is this forklift? Ah, there's a code there. Apparently you all think you know, but it's really simple. It's a 10,000 pound, 56 foot reach forklift. What a surprise, looking at your faces, I can see that you've driven forklifts and you've never learned to read the size of the forklift on the boat. So, let's go on to the next level here. See this scissors lift in the back? It is a Z45 slash 25J. What does that tell us? That tells us that it's articulating. It is an articulated forklift rather than a straight boom. A straight boom would be an S45. 45 is how high it will reach. 25 feet is how far out it will go before it tips over. And why is that important in a forklift class? Because we're talking about things tipping over on our job site. Pieces of equipment, if you overload them beyond their pivot point, they will fall over. So now you now are smarter than you were before you walked in this room today. You suddenly know how to read what's on the forklift. Isn't this great? No. And you all thought you were experts. OSHA requires we have forklift training because as we've had fewer cranes on our job sites, because a lot of cranes, a lot of accidents, employers went to forklifts. Forklifts were unregulated, they didn't require training 30 years ago, so we started to have a lot more forklifts show up on our job sites. When you have more forklifts on job sites, what are you going to have? More accidents. So now we need to figure out how to control those accidents, so that's part of the mandatory forklift training to run a forklift anywhere in the United States. 95% of all of our accidents are caused by human error. Therefore, it's logical to concentrate on the elimination of unsafe acts first and unsafe conditions second. In construction, we work in unsafe conditions. When we're building a new school and the school's all finished, we'll have guardrails and stairs and exit signs and emergency lighting. The corridors will be free of clutter, we'll have fire extinguishers, we'll have all these safety things built in for the occupants of that school. However, us in construction are always going to be exposed to falling off of something, getting run over something during the building process. So construction companies need to work on behaviors and have a good safety program because we end up working in unsafe conditions. That is inherent to what we do. So we have to concentrate on actions that prevent injury to ourselves. Forklift operators must possess the following qualities. Physically and mentally fit for duty, free of alcohol and drugs, understanding of basic math and physics, and we'll get into that. Be responsible, have a heightened awareness and concentration, have a proper attitude, you need to be in your intellectual frame of mind when you're running a forklift rather than your emotional frame of mind. So what is an example of an emotional frame of mind? <laughs> Anger, <laughs> laughter, panic. Okay? Panic for me would be my wife divorcing me. Okay? 
That would be a real big pain. But with forklift operators, it's typically panic. You're driving along, you think you're doing something right, and you make a mistake, the forklift almost tips, hits a bump, the load shifts, and you suddenly, you go from your intellectual frame of mind to, oh no, and that's a panic, panic. mode, and you stop thinking. And when we look at these forklift accidents, people went from that intellectual frame of mind to the emotional frame of mind, and then they did something with the forklift that they shouldn't have done as a reaction from panic, and we caused a greater problem. Mm. Mm. Common causes of accidents due to operator error. Operating a forklift with a known mechanical defect. In 2009, at a wastewater treatment plant job for every stand subcontractors were doing, there was a large chiller in a room that was old and worn out, and they're going to place it with a new modern piece of equipment. This old chiller was on steel skids, had a big tank on this side, and it was pretty heavy. It had a lifting eye in the center for a crane. Instead of taking the roof off, they decided to get a forklift to pull the whole unit out and then pick it up with the crane, get out of the way, pick up the new one, put it in the way, and use the forklift to push it in to the proper location. The forklift arrived on the job site from the rental company, and the forks appeared level when they took it off the trailer. But the bar that holds the forks was not in the slots. And any of you who looked at a forklift, and all of you who acknowledge that you're experts on forklifts, you know what I'm talking about. The forks were level with the bar, not in the slots. As soon as the foreman of the mechanical contra contractor's crew put the forks underneath the chiller and picked up on it, this side was heavier than the chiller, the fork slipped, the bar fell in the slot, but it forced this fork up. That toppled the, the chiller against the wall. All three mechanical employees, by the grace of God, were on this side. Had they been on this side, any one of them would have killed them in the blink of an eye. I got called out to go down and turn the chiller back over and safely move it. So during my accident investigation, I discovered that everyone had ignored the fact they were using a defective forklift. And that's part of your pre-operation inspection required on a forklift. You're supposed to look and see if it's damaged, bent or whatever, and not put it to use. Okay, so primarily whose fault was it? It was the operator. That's why we have operator training. Traveling an unsafe route, we'll talk about that with a pole fatality coming up. Carrying unsafe load, another one. And then using an unsafe operating technique. In Santa Fe, a few years back, when remodeling a gas station to build a new Starbucks, one of the contractors in the demo field had put a forklift underneath the column, I mean a beam, and they used the forklift to hold it, it was a 40 foot long steel beam, cut out the columns on each side, lowered the beam down, and then backed forward, backed and filled with the beam balancing on four foot spread of forks, until they finally went up to the trailer, and they stopped, the beam slid off because it had momentum, and the forks were pointed down, the beam fell off, bounced off the trailer, and cut an employee in half. So what would have been a better, safer way to have moved that beam? It would have been far better to have taken the time to get out of the forklift and put some plywood or boards or two by fours, some dunnage on the trailer, held the beam all the way back against the forks with the forks at an angle, and then got there and then when you get up to the trailer, boom out, lower the forks, pull out, we wouldn't have dropped the beam. But you still had that problem that beam is hard to manipulate, it could slide off. A safer way, even better, would have been to take the time to walk over to the trailer, get one of the chains off of the trailer, and tie around the center point of that beam and suspend it from the forks, hold the forks back, pick it up so you can maneuver it and set it exactly where you want. So we wouldn't have dropped the beam. These are the things that make the whole difference between a forklift accident. And in this case here, it was a matter that the operator just didn't want to take the time to get the machine. And we ended up with a fatality. This picture here shows a forklift touching a power line. The operator was trying to put that tarp, which was nailed to the pallet, which was suspended from the forks in the previous picture, into the dumpster. 
his eyes were at the bottom of the tarp. He was booming up and booming up and booming up with his forklift as he's watching the tarp clear the dumpster because there's plenty of forklift. And then as he gets to where his eyes are there, he starts lowering it. And out of peripheral vision, he sees the pole move. Because he hit the pole and suddenly it moved. He looked up, saw that forklift touching that electric line, undid his seatbelt, jumped out of the forklift, and turned himself into a cinder. Mm -hmm. This is one of those cases where the forklift operator should have one, not panicked. If he was still alive long enough to undo a seatbelt, he was still alive long enough to simply raise the fork off the power line and disconnect it. These are those sort of things that we get into that panic mode that compounds the problem. But what's the best way to prevent this accident was for the forklift operator to stop, pick up the pallet flat horizontally, bundle the tarp up on top of it so he didn't have to raise it so high so he could have dropped it in the dumpster rather than just spearing it and going up and up up and getting himself into the danger zone. Let's talk about the forklifts. The forklift is essentially a dolly. It's a very powerful, complex piece of equipment, but it, really it's a dolly. You have a big load in front, you have to have a much bigger machine or person behind you to tip it. So a skinny little guy like me can move a small cooler beer with a dolly. To move a big cooler beer, I gotta have help or a bigger person. Same thing with a forklift. Depends on the weight and size of a forklift. At my second slide, I told you about a 10,056 pound forklift. It's gonna pick up 10,000 pounds. We have 5,000 pound forklifts, we have 8,000, we have 6,000, we have 12,000, and now they're building 20,000 pound forklifts. So you need to know what kind of forklift you're gonna be operating and what its capacities are. We'll talk a little bit more about that. OSHA requires that we contrast in this training session the difference between automobiles and forklifts so that you don't just jump in a forklift and thinking it's an automobile because clearly it's not. Suspension with shock absorbers versus tires, big deal. We probably don't really care too much about that. No hydraulic lifts in automobiles. That's certainly not true in New Mexico. We have all kinds of exotic cars with hydraulic lifts. <laughs> okay, so that doesn't help us a whole lot and obviously forklifts have more than one hydraulic system. Front wheel steering versus multiple steering, that's not terribly important, but we'll talk about multiple steering in a little bit for forklifts. Consistent stability, however, this is important. 